Hello, and welcome to this episode of Pulp Crazy. We will be discussing Doc Savage, the Man of Bronze. Doc Savage first appeared in 1933. Following the success of the Shadow Magazine, Street and Smith Publications decided to create another hero to add to their stable. Doc was conceptualized by publisher Henry W. Ralston and editor John L. Nanovic. Lead writer Lester Dent fleshed out the character into the Doc Savage we know today. Writers who penned Doc Savage stories wrote under the house name Kenneth Robeson. Doc's real name is Clark Savage Jr., Dent indicated Doc was a combination of aspects of Tarzan of the Apes, Sherlock Holmes, Craig Kennedy, and Abraham Lincoln. Real-life adventurer Richard Henry Savage may also have been an inspiration for Doc. Doc is described as being six feet tall, weighing every bit of 200 pounds, and having broad skin. His hair was a slightly darker shade of bronze that sat on his head like a skull cap. He was depicted in the pulps by artist Walter Baumhofer. During the 1970s, his physical appearance would go on to change from the original pulp magazine artwork. The doc depicted on the Bantam paperback covers by James Balma is the doc savage most people are familiar with today. The Bama Doc Savage is more muscular, has a more pronounced widow's peak, has slightly darker skin, and is often depicted with a torn shirt. Bama used actor and model Steve Holland as his reference for Doc. Doc Savage was and is a very influential character. Without Doc, we wouldn't have Superman or Batman. Doc had a fortress of solitude in the Arctic, long before Superman did. And the gadgets Doc came up with predated anything Batman would come up with by many years, which includes a utility belt. Doc was a paragon of fitness and mental acuity. Trained by his father and other scientists from birth, to master just about everything. He uses these talents to fight crime with the assistance of his aides. In today's superhero comics, a debated topic is the morality in altering someone's brain to change their behavior. Back in the 1930s, Doc opened his crime college in upstate New York and would perform surgical operations on captured villains to rehabilitate them. Successful graduates from the college would re-enter society. Some would even go on to work for Doc. That questionable practice aside, it should be pointed out that Green Lantern wasn't the first superhero with an oath. Doc had his own oath that he aspired to. The Doc Savage Oath. Although Doc is the star of the series, he also had support from a very talented and capable supporting cast of aides. Monk Mayfair, a master chemist. Ham Brooks, a gifted attorney. Rennie, a master engineer. Long Tom Roberts, an electrical wizard, and Johnny Littlejohn, an archaeologist. Doc is also joined on some adventures by his cousin, Patricia Pat Savage. Their adventures take them from New York City to exotic locations around the globe. Although it is never stated, it is strongly hinted that Doc operates out of the 86th floor of the Empire State Building. From March 1933 through the summer of 1949, 
181 issues of Doc Savage magazine were published. Since then, the character has experienced a resurgence during the 1970s paperback craze, with Bantam reprinting the series in its entirety. Lately, pulp historian and author Will Murray has continued Doc Savage's adventures, writing as Kenneth Robeson. The Wild Adventures of Doc Savage, penned by Murray, are currently being published by Altus Press. Also, Murray's Doc Savage novels that were published by Bantam as a continuation of the series are currently being adapted into audiobooks at Radio Archives. If you are interested in seeing the genesis of the modern-day superhero, I highly recommend you read some Doc Savage stories. Or, if you are interested in reading some entertaining action and adventure fiction set during the 1930s, Doc Savage should be right up your alley. Start with The Man of Bronze. It is a lot of fun and very interesting. Be sure to check out these great Doc Savage websites. I will put links and descriptions in the show notes. Uvula Audio has a full, unabridged audiobook for the first Doc Savage novel, The Man of Bronze, available to listen to for free. I have included a sample of the first chapter. Enjoy. The red-fingered man scuttled onto a workman's platform. The planks were thick. The platform was near the outside of a wilderness of steel. The man lowered his black case. His inner pocket disgorged compact, powerful binoculars. Focusing on the lowermost floor of a skyscraper, many blocks distant, the scarlet-fingered man adjusted his glasses. He started counting stories upward. The building was the tallest one in New York, a gleaming spike of steel and brick. It rammed upward nearly a hundred stories. At the 86th floor, the sinister man ceased to count. His glasses moved right and left until they found a lighted window. This was at the west corner of the building. Only slightly blurred by the rain, the powerful binoculars disclosed what was in the room. The broad, polished top of a massive and exquisitely inlaid table stood directly before the window. Beyond it was the bronze figure. This looked like the head and shoulders of a man, sculptured in hard bronze. It was a startling sight, that bronze bust. The lines of the features, the unusually high forehead, the mobile and muscular mouth, the lean cheeks denoted a power of character seldom seen. The bronze of the hair was a little darker than the bronze of the features. The hair was straight and laid down tightly as a metal skull cap. A genius at sculpture might have made this. Most marvelous of all were the eyes. They glittered like pools of flake gold when little lights from the table lamp played upon them. Even from that distance, they seemed to exert a hypnotic influence through the powerful binocular lenses, a quality that would cause the most rash individual to hesitate. The man with the scarlet-tipped fingers shuddered. Death! he croaked as if seeking to overcome the unnerving quality of those strange golden eyes. The son of the feathered serpent has commanded, it shall be death. He opened the black box. Metallic clicking sounded as he fitted together parts of the thing it held. After that, he ran his fingers lovingly over the object. The tool of the son of the feathered serpent, he chortled. It shall deliver death. Once more he pressed the binoculars to his eyes, 
and focused them on the amazing bronze statue. The bronze masterpiece opened its mouth and yawned, for it was no statue but a living man. The bronze man showed wide, very strong-looking teeth and yawning. Seated there by the immense desk, he did not seem to be a large man. An onlooker would have doubted his six-foot height and would have been astounded to learn that he weighed every ounce of two hundred pounds. The big bronze man was so well put together that the impression was not of size, but of power. The bulk of his great body was forgotten in the smooth symmetry of a build incredibly powerful. This man was Clark Savage, Jr., Doc Savage, the man whose name was becoming a byword in the odd corners of the world. Apparently no sound had entered the room, but the big bronze man left his chair. He went to the door. The hand he opened the door with was long-fingered, supple, yet its enormous tendons were like cables under a thin film of bronze lacquer. Doc Savage's keenness of hearing was vindicated. Five men were getting out of the elevator cage, which had come up silently. These men came toward Doc. There was wild delight in their manner, but for some sober reason they did not shout boisterous greetings. It was as though Doc bore a great grief, and they sympathized deeply with him, but didn't know what to say. The first of the five men was a giant who towered four inches over six feet. He weighed fully 250 pounds. His face was severe, his mouth thin and grim and compressed tightly, as though he had just finished uttering a disapproving tisk-tisk. His features had a most puritanical look. This was Rennie, or Colonel John Renwick. His arms were enormous, his fists bony monstrosities. His favorite act was to slam his great fists through solid panels of heavy doors. He was known throughout the world for his engineering accomplishments also. Behind Rennie came William Harper Littlejohn, very tall, very gaunt. Johnny wore glasses with a peculiarly thick lens over the left eye. He looked like a half-starved, studious scientist. He was probably one of the greatest living experts on geology and archaeology. Next was Major Thomas J. Roberts, dubbed Long Tom. Long Tom was the physical weakling in the crowd, thin, not very tall, and with none too healthy appearing skin. He was a wizard with electricity. Ham trailed Long Tom, Brigadier General Theodore Marley Brooks, Ham was designated on formal occasions. Slender, waspy, quick-moving, Ham looked what he was, a quick thinker and possibly the most astute lawyer Harvard had ever turned out. He carried a plain black cane, never went anywhere without it. This was, among other things, a sword cane. Last came the most remarkable character of all. Only a few inches over five feet tall, he weighed better than 260 pounds. He had the build of a gorilla, arms six inches longer than his legs, a chest thicker than it was wide. His eyes were so surrounded by gristle as to resemble pleasant little stars twinkling in pits. He grinned with a mouth so very big it looked like an accident. Monk, no other name could fit him. He was Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Blodgett Mayfair, but he heard the full name so seldom he had about forgotten what it sounded like. Thank you for watching. Please visit the website at www.pulpcrazy.com. I am also at Pope Crazy on Twitter. Until next time.